Hi everyone. Um, I hope everybody's coping with the new implementation. Um, welcome again to Stylistics class. Today I will be discussing the modalities and frameworks in Stylistics. So basically we will do a recap of uh, the journal articles we have discussed um, in our class. In our class. Uh, so we'll do a quick recap um, evaluating all of them, especially the frameworks and modalities. So um, on the first column, these are the learning outcomes. So you are expected to identify uh, modalities, theoretical and methodological frameworks used by the journal articles presented. Um, at the end of this presentation, you can also at least uh, meet the mastery of evaluating the applicability of theoretical and methodological frameworks to your future research, evaluate the implication of the research studies, and synthesize importance, contribution, and relationships of the articles through a reflection paper. Now, to assess uh, the things that you have learned in this presentation, um, I will be posting critical questions, and these are the um, focus questions for processing. These will be posted um, on a specific channel I will be creating on our Microsoft Teams. So I'll be posting these questions separately, and you guys have to share or answer um, these questions. And you're given two weeks to at least participate. Also, um, at um, on Friday, um, we will be doing a workshop, so um, uh, make sure that you are all available so that you may receive the handouts for the workshop. You're also given a, a time to do the workshop. On the other hand, the reflection paper will no longer be uh, provided. We will only have one re reflection paper and that was already given in our team. So please submit all of your reaction papers to those who haven't submitted. And moving forward, we will no longer have a re reflection paper as we agreed in our online discussion. So the first journal article that was discussed in the class was written by Jiang Shengshi. It titled Metaphors and Metonymies in New York Times and Times Supplement News Headlines. So basically, the paper is concerned with the stylistic variations between the Times Supplement. Um, this is a newspaper for Taiwanese and New York Times newspaper for Americans. So they compared the headlines of the two newspapers. And they also investigated the use of non-lexicalized conceptual metaphors and metonymies. So I have here an example of um, the headline written by um, New York Times. This is actually a newspaper for American readers. Uh, so we, as we can see, this is very contextualized. And the headline here is very metaphorical that um, a speaker coming from a, a second language, a nation, or uh, a foreign language um, circle will not automatically understand because of the use of linguistic forms. And so the tendency is that in the time supplement, the writers actually change or modify their linguistic forms they make it more simpler uh, they make it more simple they make it more uh, understandable unlike in the new york times it creates a, a metaphorical concept uh, in the brain compared with um, a sample article written by written for Taipei or Taiwanese readers the headlines says temple tries to appeal to young people so if you observe these linguistic forms are very simple no very uh, understandable unlike in the headlines in the New York Times 
it's very metaphorical. So basically, that's the concern of the article. They compared the linguistic forms, non-lexicalized and lexicalized forms of headlines of the newspapers. The theoretical framework used in the article was anchored on Cash Rue's theory on, uh, about concentric circle. The assumption is that uh, languages are bounded in um, a particular group of nations. So if you are coming from the inner circle, you are considered ENL or a native uh, speaker. If you are coming from the outer circle, you are considered uh, an ESL or a second language user. On the other hand, People coming from the expanding circle are considered uh, English as a foreign language. In this case, Taiwan is actually, um, Taiwan belongs to the expanding circle. Hence, English is something foreign to them. So you see, uh, the assumption is that writers tend to modify, tend to really uh, appropriate or tend to use linguistic forms that would contextualize and make the headlines more appropriate for the readers. Methodological framework used in the study was corpus-based stylistics. Um, so the researcher analyzed uh, 605 pairs of corresponding headlines and they compared, okay, they just, just to post Two of the um, main corpus coming from New York Times headlines and Times supplement headlines and they investigated the lexicalized and a non-lexicalized metaphor or metonymy. Um, they also used a standard dictionary, the Oxford English Dictionary, to verify whether the linguistic form is lexicalized or non-lexicalized. So when we say lexicalized, the linguistic forms are found in the dictionary, while non-lexicalized, uh, these are uh, metaphors, uh, meta conceptual metaphors or metonymies. Um, so the article and the researcher uh, reveals their findings, and this is the summary, that non-lexicalized metaphors and metonymies in the corpus have the following functions. It has cognitive, pragmatic, or stylistic functions to perform. And uh, these are the summary. Uh, it is performed essentially to pull in potential readers, so to motivate and to entice uh, more readers. Yeah, because imagine if you don't understand a, a particular linguistic form, definitely comprehension already hinders for you to buy the newspaper or for you to read the newspaper. If the headline is something um, familiar, appropriated, and contextualized, definitely readers, uh, there, there will be potential readers and there will be potential buyers of newspapers. Second, to guide pragmatic inference in text interpretation. So it is more contextualized. Um, whatever is written in the newspaper is um, the phenomena of the society that the speaker or the reader belongs. Uh, to understand a relatively unfamiliar concept in terms of something more familiar. So these non-lexicalized functions as um, a pragmatic and at the same time cognitive, something that is familiar. Okay, they, the writer tends to um, um, contextualize and appropriate the language use, and that is what we meant by familiar compared to the news uh, the, the news headlines of Times New York Times it's very abstract for the EFL readers next to exaggerate an aspect of the news story to grab attention yes to foreshadow the whole of the main idea of the story so as to entice the reader 
um, foreshadow or foregrounding is used especially uh, among writers who would like to state main idea and that is one of the characteristics of writing headlines you have to make the headline shorter and what you put in the headline uh, is the main idea of the text or the content of the newspaper so basically that's foreshadowing or foregrounding whatever are the linguistic forms used in the headlines these are foregrounded in uh, the content of the news article lastly to provide mental access to something that is linguistically more economical cognitively more readily accessible pragmatically more appropriate or rhetorically more effective um, so that's the the functions of uh, the non-lexicalized metaphors and metonymies found in the article they they aim to have an economic economical value among the readers cognitively appropriate and understandable and pragmatically uh, contextualized okay Second article that was discussed was written by Sarah Lee titled Style Shifting in Vlogging, an Acoustic Analysis of YouTube Voice, specifically uh, the style shifting of a vlogger named Phil, uh, Phil Les Lester. Uh, he's a famous vlogger in UK. Um, what's interesting about his style is that his, his accent and his style shifts in different contexts. Uh, because in, in vlog, there's a live vlog, there's a scripted vlog, there's collaborative vlog. So, in this article, his style shifting was compared in different contexts. The research questions were the following. First, uh, the researcher would like to uh, unpack uh, the following. To demonstrate how video context correlates significantly with Lester's vowel production, indicating a context-based style shifting. So this is what I'm trying to say, no? So uh, the researcher would like to compare whether there is style shifting in different contexts, like live vlog, collaborative vlog, scripted vlog, etc. Second, to compare Lester's format values to data from RP, which is the standard accent in UK, SSBE, and Lancashire English speakers. So the researcher would like to investigate whether uh, Phil Lester, the vlogger, um, portray a particular accent. Is he um, portraying um, a particular style here or is he shifting from standard variety to SSBE variety or to Lancashire English variety. Next, to evaluate which of the three intraspeaker variation models may explain Lester's behavior best. Um, so these are the models, audience design or attention paid to speech, uh, and also speaker design. So these are the uh, speaker variation models. So the researcher would like to identify whether uh, Phil Lester shows uh, through his style shifting a particular membership or does he shift because he'd like to cater international audience or does Lester pay attention to his speech? Okay. So the theoretical grounding used in the paper were the following. First was Labove, 1966, which is style as attention to speech. Um, in this case, the assumption is that the more you pay attention to speech, the more unnatural or um, difficult to gauge the style. Because in the study of Lavov, he conducted um, the variation among the speakers in terms of the sound of R, like the roticity value. So he went to the supermarket to investigate that. And so he asked questions, like, for example, um, where's the music 
section here and the speaker would answer him it's on fourth floor so the r there is pronounced okay but when Lebov re-asked or rephrased his question could you repeat the speaker would say fourth floor so the ten the tendency is that when they pay attention to their speech, you would see uh, style shifting or variations in the sounds. So the assumption is that when we don't pay attention to our speech, people would see style shiftings. But the more we pay attention to our speech, the more we are controlled with our style. Okay, so that is Attention to Speech by Lebeau. Second is Bell, 1984, Audience Design. It's an act of modifying speech according to our audience. So we, we stylize or we shift our styles because we cater to a particular speakers. Okay, so for example, in the context of our classroom, so you guys are second language users. And most of you um, are coming from the provinces. Hence, I have to modify or stylize my own speech to cater um, my audience, which is the general class. Unlike if my audience would be, for example, in the context of conference, my um, audience are international speakers. Tendency is that I would modify my speech to cater for an international lingua franca. So there's change of style. Okay. Even in different contexts, um, it shows membership or belongingness. So if you'd like to show solidarity, you have to adapt or you have to converge yourself in that particular a group of speakers so there's um, convergence it's either you are shifting to a particular style because you'd like to to be considered as a member of that speech group so that's convergence or you're trying to move away from that particular member hence what you do is you diverge okay uh, lastly, Speaker Design by Schilling Estes 1998. It is an act to project group membership or identity. Uh, so, at some point, there's overlapping in uh, Speaker Design uh, because uh, in the Speaker Design, um, what you do is you're trying to construct a particular identity that the way you speak uh, associates to your profession, like a professor. The way you stylize your speech is linked to your social identity as someone who is educated, someone who has a um, who has a rich economic status or something like that. So what you do here in the speaker design is that you possess a particular style or speech style in relation to your identity um, in whatever way you, you represent yourself. For example, if you represent yourself as uh, a journalist, compared to the identity of a professor, um, style or linguistic forms and accent varies okay, in different identities. So uh, let's watch a short video for us to be able to evaluate what is the style variation model that these speakers may possess. Hey, baby, didn't I tell you to bring all my bread round to my crib? Miles, you're not black enough. Get down with your bad self. Hey, baby, didn't I tell you to come by my crib with my bread? That's it. What it is. Miles Pope thought he'd hit bottom. I'm an actor, Harvey, not a piece of fruit. Until the mob decided to hit him. By this time tomorrow, I want that Pope dead. Now the only way he won't get whacked Cut him up and make sandwiches. I gotta disappear now. Is to give the performances of his life. 
Uh, the unit itself has seven foot high ceilings that are highlighted with a kind of a synthetic gold flex. <laughs> Lord Percy Chisley P.D. Smythe of South Worcestershire upon Avon speaking. But Miles is such a master of disguise. Great go, the Look, uh, I'll buzz you back when I'm cellular, okay, babe? He's been hired by the mob. I want Pope dead to whack himself. Ah! Piece of cake. <laughs> Touchstone Pictures presents One Man's Quest to Save His Skin. Just feed them fish and you whack them? <laughs> yeah, well, us hit guys. Hey, hey, hey. Gotta maintain a high standard. I'm a mulatto. From the waist down, that's how it happens sometimes. Another day, another wackaroni unio. Can't believe that punk kid fooled me. All right, so you guys, uh, I'd like you guys to at least analyze the video. Um, so you can observe the identity uh, of the speakers. Um, so you can take a pause and try to analyze it. Um, I won't be using this as your workshop or I won't be making this as your workshop. Uh, but this is actually a potential workshop that we can do in the future. So for now, I'd like, I'd like you to pause and then try to analyze this. Alright, so since this is uh, recorded, uh, I can't really pause it but to continue this discussion so if you observe um miles or the actor changed his identity from black to white right so in that case when you change your your identity uh and that is a social variable okay so the way black people talk is different from how americans talk and that is very observable in the first scene in which um, he is black, but he talks like an American, hence the director asked him to talk naturally, be a black guy or be a black actor in uh, the scene. The same way in the succeeding scenarios or situations in which he uh, wants to keep himself away from the bad guys in the, in the movie, hence he has to identify himself as someone who is white. And so whenever he uh, identifies himself or whenever he disguises himself as someone white, he has to conform with the norms of the American white culture, different from the black culture. So what is the style variation model that you can think here? Um, in a way, very dominant here is the speaker design in which he identify himself as someone who is black hence he has to conform or he has to use the black um, style uh, of languaging um, in, on the other hand if he'd like uh, he would like to change his identity to an american um, uh, identity he has to shift or style shift his speech to an american uh, linguistic norm. Uh, at some point, there's also um, an audience design here, but because since he's trying to disguise, he has to be fluid and he has to um, keep himself um, in the membership of a, a particular social group, which are the white people. Or he is trying to make himself blend in in the white uh, norm uh, society because if not then he will be killed I guess that's the that's the movie I don't I haven't really seen the movie but uh, it's very cool to watch it okay now the methodological framework used in this study was case study specifically the case of Phil Lester and then the mixed model regression I don't really know um, I don't really know the mixed model, but I'm familiar with the regression. I have done this. Um, so this is separate discussion. What I'd like you to focus on would be um, the, the, uh, the theoretical frameworks and at the same time methodological, but not specifically the, the statistical part. Okay, so the results revealed that Lester lowered and fronted many of his vowels in the live contexts. 
Lester did not show a consistent movement towards the standard, the SSBE, or the Lancashire English like format values in any context. So, um, Lester, Phil Lester is not really con consistent of uh, the way he stylized his speech. We cannot really gauge whether he's into the standard variety, the SSBE variety, or the Lancashire variety. On the other hand, it is intriguing that La Lester clearly possesses the split um, sound, which is the um, the UK sound, the um, the trap bath. Okay, it's not the combined AE sound, unlike in American way of pronouncing it, like trap bath. So Lester is um, possessing a split sound here. Also, Lebov's 1966 attention to attention paid to speech model best explains the result. Under this model, we would expect higher usage of prestigious variants by Lester, particularly those of RP in the solo vlog context. So, I guess attention paid to speech model was best explained uh, for the result. On the other hand, Lester's style shifts based on the context of the video, not because of the audience design or speaker design performative register, but because of increased attention paid to speech in more scripted context. Because it is scripted, tendencies that the vlogger always pay attention to his speech. That's why it's difficult to really evaluate whether uh, there's variance in his speech. Okay, as we take note of this, uh, did not show consistency in terms of the variations or stylistic variation. It is because Lester is always very conscious. Uh, he always pay attention to his speech whenever he do vlogging. That's why it's difficult for us to gauge um, his uh, stylistic variation. Moving forward, the third research article that was discussed in the class was uh, titled Code Switching and Code Mixing, a Stylistic Devices in Nigerian Prose Fiction, a study of three Nigerian novels. So in this study, there were actually three Nigerian novels um, that was analyzed. First was A Man of the People by Chinuach Achibi. Second was The Purple Hibiscus. And a third a novel that was analyzed was Everything Good Will Come by Sefi Atta. Now, the assumption of this article is that um, to effectively and adequately articulate the Nigerian culture in English, the language undergoes structural adjustments and changes. In the attempts by Nigerian prose writers to adequately cater for the varying local situations in their works, they employ various stylistic creative devices and strategies among which are code switching and code mixing. Um, so the assumption is that if you are a writer, a novelist, and you are um, from Nigeria, hence you possess the Nigerian culture. In that case, if you are a writer, you have to cater to your audience um, by adjusting the structure of the language. And how did they do that? They employed code switching and code mixing just to cater for the further audience and at the same time to show Nigerian culture. So when we define code mixing and code switching, uh, these concepts are dissimilar. When we say code switching, it's an alternate use of two or more languages in the same utterance or conversation. Okay. According to Appel and Moiskin 1987, code mixing on the on the other hand is an intra-sentential switch occurring in the mid-sentence. So if you notice, 
uh, if, if we can highlight this, two or more languages in the same conversation. Compared to code mixing, it is in the middle or intrasentential level. So within a sentence, there is a mix of codes, while um, a mix or uh, a switching of codes happens um, in a se sentential level. Another definition um, about code switching and code mixing. First, code switching is the mixing of words, phrases, and sentences from two distinct grammatical subsystems across sentence boundaries within the same speech event. Um, code mixing, on the other hand, is the embedding, okay, inserting in other words, of various linguistic units such as affixes, okay, bound morphemes, words or unbound morphemes, phrases and clauses from a cooperative activity where the participants, in order to infer what is intended, must reconcile what they hear with what they understand. So basically, that's the difference of code switching and code mixing. More definition, code mixing is the use of two languages in the same utterance or within one sentence. There's a mix of two uh, codes. For example, uh, um, I went to uh, I went to the paaralan. Okay, well, that's very unnatural of me. Um, so there's that's the there's a code mixing of two languages within a sentence. First, were, first words were English and the latter words were Tagalog. Code switching, uh, switching completely from one language to another, from one sentence to another. Uh, for example, I was here yesterday, kaso na late ako. Okay? So there's actually two. Okay, uh, I switched to, I switched from English to Tagalog, but on my second sentence, there's the word late, which is English, hence that is code mixing. Next, code switching, it's like switching of trees, unlike code mixing, um, it's embedding, uh, it's embedding the, the product of one tree to another tree. So let's try to analyze this video. Let's watch another video. And this is very interesting. This is very local. And you can really relate. So I'd like you to watch the video, pause, and then analyze what is the linguistic practice of the speakers. Um, how, what is predominant? Is it code switching or code mixing? And how would you describe the switching and mixing of the codes? Good evening, boy. Good evening, Chrissy. My mga anak ang hila na ikaw ay nirash sa hospital. Yes. Karina, what happened? So, nahilo ko. As in major pagkahilo while taping in Intramuros. Do sa init? Yes. Uh, to, we started taping 2 in the afternoon. I started in Manila Cathedral. Tapos umikot with Carlos Celdran around Intramuros walking. And by about 4.15, boy, talagang parang umikot na. Yung ano. And then I was cold sweat, uh, extreme headache, body ache and all. So nagpadala na ako sa hospital. Thank you to the people in Makati Med for taking good care of me. I was dehydrated. Bumagsak lahat ng electrolytes ko. I'm anemic. Yeah, I had my blood works done, so meron ako mababaying, I think that's the red blood cell count and the hemoglobin count was very low. Okay. But that's, yun hereditary yun, pero yung lack of electrolytes, I, I guess it was the heat, and it's, sinabi sa akin ng doktor ko kanina, i-warn daw lahat kayong lahat na the hottest time of the day is about 1 p.m. to 4 p.m., and if possible, avoid being outdoors. It's a lesson learned for us. Uh, I'm from now, water. Yeah, but I was drinking, boy. Nakatatlong ah, 500 ml ako while taping, eh. And so, ang lesson lang po sa lahat ng nanunood sa atin, if you can avoid being outdoors from 1 to 4 p.m., please try to avoid it, especially now. Dahil, yun talaga, boy, grabe yung 
first time ko ma-experience yung ganung level of pagkahilo talaga. So now, magsa-sacrifice ang Chris TV. We'll start taping at 7 in the morning para by 12 noon, we're done. Okay, you cannot uh, be exposed from 1 o'clock to 4 o'clock in the afternoon. At lahat sila lalo na si Darla, yeah. na sabi niya hindi na lang siya matutulog. Pero ayon sa aking mga sources, merong itinanong ang doktor sa iyo. Ito <laughs> naman, mga kaibigan, yun po ang official statement ni Ms. Chris Aquino. Pero naman, tinanong ako, nakakalang ka ng doktor, bago niya ako alam ko ano, ano sabi niya, Mom, I hope you don't mind. Sabi ko, okay. yes. Well, Hilo-hilo pa ako. I just have to know, are you pregnant? Sabi ko, no, I'm not pregnant, Doc. Nakakaloka. <laughs> Hindi po ako pwedeng mabuntis. Wala po akong ginagawa para mabuntis ako. Ang sabi ko po kay Ms. Chris Aquino, that was that? a logical question. Because nga ako lalagyan ka na kung ano-anong gamot. Dapat, oh, diba? Pero hindi po. All right. So, please take a pause and try to analyze um, the linguistic practices of the two speakers. Or you can just focus on Chris as the speaker. Okay, so I can't really pause this because this is recorded. Uh, so if you notice, Chris Aquino, um, it's very evident that code mixing, code switching is uh, the practice or linguistic practice of the two speakers. Uh, but if you observe, Chris Aquino, what is very dominant here? Is it code switching or code mixing? Well, we don't really have the transcript, but as I observe uh, in the video, the predominant linguistic practice is code switching. Okay, If we count the occurrences of how many code switches uh, she has done, it is more dominant than code mixing. Um, I guess we, we can do a transcript analysis. We can do a transcript analysis of this so that we can prove that it is more of code switching than code mixing. Moving forward, in the third article, they used the content analysis as a methodological framework. And content analysis has many um, sub-frameworks uh, such as um, in, on a lexical level, sentential level, so it has um, analytical frameworks too. The findings uh, showed that uh, in the novel, there are two linguistic practices, code switching and code mixing. Switching from and to Standard English, Pidgin English, and Igbo language. And there's also an evidence of code mixing in the novel, in the three novels. There's insertion of Igbo words. There's insertion of Yura, Yuraba and Hausa words. And insertion of popular Nigerian English. Alright, so uh, this is our last article discussed um, in our previous meetings um, by Mahmoud titled Linguistic Effects on Television Advertisement, a Stylistic Approach. Basically, this paper examines the language of television advertisement and brings to the fore the overtly observable linguistic features which characterize it and their usages for analysis by looking at the grammatical and lexical distinctions that differentiate the language of advertisement from other modes of discourse. So this is another modality. So first, uh, the model of language, in the first article, the model of language was via newspaper. The second was vlogs. The third was, um, forgot. Okay, anyway, uh, the fourth one is, uh, the mode is a television advertisement and uh, the stylistic approach in the television advertisement. So, uh, in this research, in this research, Mahmoud tries to examine um, the distinction, the observable linguistic features in television advertisement that makes them a differentiated language. Okay? Because in a, in a typical conversation, this is how we talk. But in terms of a different modal, which is television advertisement, it's very creative. Um, 
and very encouraging, very motivating, especially for selling products. So uh, what what they do is that the writers behind these um, promos or products, they tend to really um, be creative in in using uh, linguistic forms. Okay, they have a um, economic uh, profit. Okay, in return for using these linguistic forms. For example, um, this picture get ten times better cleaning. So the linguistic form. So if we analyze this, it functions as verb get. Okay, and they also resort to using numbers to shorten um, the ads. Uh, they also tend to bold the letters. Okay. Another is that um, the Royco advertisement. See the use of um, now. The word now. It's like it's it's referring to you. You buy it now, or it's in the present time. Okay. It has lots of functions here. Or a real product, no? So remove stuff stains, protects colors in one wash. So the action, this is verb. It functions as an action word, which refers to this product that Ariel removes stuff stains, protect colors in one wash. So it's not really a complete sentence, but they use foregrounding too. Okay, they use um, important linguistic forms uh, to market a particular product. Okay, another example. Okay, so the assumptions in the article was, stylistician looks at the text from the point of view of how it deviates from the norms. So as a stylistician, you have to... Um, Look at the things in a different perspective, whether it is normal or something different. Okay, something that deviates from a particular norm. If it does, then it's another style. You view it as another or different, different style, different from the norms. The general rules and standard features of the English language, therefore, serve as the basis of reference in the analysis, the style of the language of television advertisement in this paper. So the assumption is that in a typical conversation, we tend to use um, complete sentences like there's, um, a sing there's a subject, verb, and object, but um, in television ads, they do not use a complete sentences. Later, we'll find out because they only resort into um, important linguistic forms. They tend to shorten um, their ads or the linguistic features in their ads. And why do they do that? Because they tend to deviate from the norm. They tend to be differentiated by the people. If, it, if the people perceive it something different, if you see it something new, something um, that deviates from an English language, then I would say that attracts potential buyers. In writing an advertisement piece, a copywriter stylistically manipulates the linguistic features that are ordinarily unmarked in daily usages as a device to create style there. So they create style by deviating from the norm. Theoretical grounding, um, the researcher used a stylistics framework. Okay. The goal of literary stylistic is to explain the relationship between the language and the artistic features. The style of a text resides in the linguistic highlights. And this is true. The style um, is embodied by the linguistic forms. And you can observe style in the linguistic forms. And that is stylistics. Moving forward, methodological framework is stylistic approach. So, 
um, the data was sourced from an Ondo State Radio Vision Corporation Channel 23 advertisements. There were 140 utterances uh, accounted for and uh, they used stylistic statistical analysis technique to analyze uh, numerical data and frequency count of marked discourse. There's actually um, consistency issue in this paper. No, um, the number of utterances, the number of corpus were, were not um, consistent. The findings of this particular study is that the stylistic features of the language of advertisement identified in the sampled advertisements are ellipsis, uh, substitutions, coordination, contraction, repetition, simple sentence, and declarative sentences. So this is how um, the writers behind these television ads creatively or stylistically um, stylize their linguistic forms. They use ellipses perhaps to um, at least uh, make the, the audience or the viewers feel thrilled okay uh, substitution so instead of using a particular word they substitute it uh, into a particular creative linguistic form coordination with the use of and perhaps there's a lot of ideas in the product and they tend to use the coordination word and Contraction, so uh, this is very typical, especially if you'd like to shorten your ads. So they will resort into contracting words like haven't, couldn't. Um, so those are examples of contraction. Repetition of words, okay, because the more you repeat it, the more um, engaging it would be, the more attracting it would be for the viewers. If it's something repeated to you, those are the things that the viewers would remember. So that's a marketing strategy. Simple sentence, okay? Um, they will not make it abstract, uh, obviously, because it's an ad. Their goal is to pull potential buyers um, and potential customers. Hence, they, they made it more appropriate and they made it more contextualized and more understandable. And they also use declarative sentence. Why? Because if you're trying to entice and motivate your customers, of course, you have to declare that it removes uh, stains if you wash it just once. No, you don't really use an interrogative sentence or make it an, an interrogative form because you are not putting your product, uh, a questionable product, in terms of its effectiveness No, and other um uh, effects. You need to make it declarative. You are declaring as uh, a producer, a product owner, a business owner that this product um, creates these effects. So let's watch another video. Um, I, I really, I, I, I forgot what this video was, but let's watch it. When you long for something good, it stays in your mind. When you want it so much, you crave it deep inside. And when you get it, it's jolly be good. When you get it, it's jolly be good. All the good things you hunger for, it's jolly be good. Okay, so after um, viewing it or watching it, you focus on the text or you focus on the repetition of the words. It's jolly be good. Perhaps if, if, if we analyze it using a standard English, it's very good. Okay, so um, in this case, there was substitution of the word. So they... they uh, replaced a particular word to Jollibee as a marketing strategy that Jollibee is good. Um, there. So it's Jollibee good. It is marked. Okay. So my analysis is that 
there's contraction of words. It's versus it is. Jolly be good. Simple and declarative sentence. And then the SVO is marked. Um, it is good. It is very good. Okay, so that is um, marked. The object is marked. 